so it will be the last presentation for today. This will be done by uh, Alexey Bjorkin, software engineer from uh, Synopsis. The uh, presentation will be about open vector. Uh, no, no, let's say hello to Alexey. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone type. Uh, good afternoon, all ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today I will uh, talk a little bit about OpenWRT, which was actually discussed uh, a little bit on a different presentation today. And uh, actually I think I uh, thought that a uh, guy will be here today, but probably he forgot or some other things uh, with uh, which he's busy. Okay, so uh, my name is again is Alexey Brodkin. I work for our Synopsis, uh, and so let me start my presentation then. Uh, first, let's start from uh, looking at what uh, we are going to discuss today, uh, and probably even before that, I I'd like to uh, make uh, a couple of notes. Uh, first, I'm a systems engineer, uh, so I uh, know uh, something about. Uh, low-level stuff like uh, how hardware works, how low-level uh, software works, but I barely have understanding of uh, how works uh, something like HTTPD or something. So probably uh, that means you may know much more than me in this area and uh, you won't be satisfied with what you are going to see here because it might be a little bit low-level for you. Uh, and another uh, thing that I want to note, uh, it will be pretty high-level presentation because scope of things I'm going to discuss today is uh, quite huge and uh, we won't be able to dip uh, in low-level de low details of everything even though uh, something I like to highlight and uh, again probably it will be of interest for at least for some of you. Uh, so what we are going to talk about today, a brief introduction of myself, uh, then uh, we will figure out why I'm going to talk about OpenWRT, actually why I was involved in the first place, uh, then uh, what is OpenWRT at all, uh, historical overview, because I think it might be important and interesting as well. And then we will uh, come to the most interesting part about uh, how actually embedded system and uh, in a bigger uh, picture how any uh, device uh, which runs Linux uh, starts from the very beginning, from power on to the uh, state when it may execute something big and fancy like, again, HTTPD or something else. Uh, from that, uh, we will understand actually uh, which components we need to build uh, to get everything up and running. Uh, that will bring us uh, to the discussion of the build system of that uh, uh, open source distribution. And so then we will cover a little bit uh, how actually it gets deployed on your target device because it might be interesting as well. And finally, uh, we will uh, uh, make some summary uh, what is good there, what is not that good, and so a couple of uh, tips and uh, notes so that I think uh, could be useful and interesting. So uh, talking about myself, I work at uh, Synopsis in St. Petersburg. Uh, in a group which is involved in open source development for our uh, CPU course. Uh, I've been uh, in embedded development for about 10 years, probably a little bit more. And so what I do uh, currently in uh, Synopsis, uh, I support uh, Synopsis uh, development boards uh, in Linux kernel. Uh, these are drivers, platform stuff. Uh, I was uh, the person who made uh, a port of U boot bootloader for our architecture. Uh, then I contribute uh, a lot in build root, so build system, and uh, since UCLIPC library is the only C library that we use, uh, so I have to deal with that uh, from time to time, deal in terms of uh, as a developer, but not as a user. I use it essentially daily. And so uh, finally, OpenWRT, that's the thing uh, we are going to talk today. Uh, that was uh, like a summary of all the previous components. So previous components were important for me uh, to know and uh, to have experience with it. Uh, helped me a lot with OpenWRT. So uh, what is... Uh, that thing and so why actually I uh, started to think about that and uh, why I was involved in development. So in uh, Synopsis we have Arc CPU core which might be configured uh, in a such a way that it may run Linux kernel. And so also we know that uh, some of our customers who use our IP core in their SOCs uh, they uh, built uh, those S SOCs for uh, network oriented devices like wireless routers and uh, some uh, network switches and uh, smart chip, uh, uh, smart uh, switches and uh, so on. And so uh, recently we started to get more and more requests about, okay, so guys, do you have OpenWRT support for your architecture because we want to use it in our product. So the decision was made, if we don't have it, 
let's do that. And so, so uh, what is that thing? Again, I think uh, Pavel mentioned uh, today pretty obvious uh, uh, thing. If uh, something is mentioned in uh, on Wikipedia, so why don't we just uh, use that definition? So OpenWRT is embedded uh, operating system based on Linux kernel, primary used in embedded devices to route network traffic. The main companies are Linux kernel, uh, UC Lipsier, Musil, and BusyBox. So that's a very essential part and brief description, which is uh, we're a good one. And so uh, just uh, for you to get uh, some impression, what is interesting here, uh, this embedded Linux distribution supports more than uh, 10 different CPU architectures, more than 40 different platforms or SOCs, and more than 1,000 devices. And so compared to other uh, distributions like desktop ones, so like Debian, Fedora, and so on, uh, what I talk supports here, I mean, binary packages for all these uh, thousand devices actually get built automatically uh, will, with build system. It is not that you may, uh, with some hacking, uh, make it work on your special hardware. No, uh, here we make everything uh, built and uh, you may just grab that image and use it, deploy on your device and uh, use it. So probably that's uh, the most, uh, that distribution which uh, builds for more platforms than anything else. Uh, another nice thing, it may run on very low power and uh, restricted devices, restricted in terms of uh, hardware possibilities, like we need a very small amount of memory, uh, both uh, for uh, like RAM and <coughs> uh, flash, and we don't need a lot of megahertz compared to desktop uh, distributions. So another nice thing, it is package-based, uh, so it is exactly uh, the same th thing as you have in this desktop distribution. When you just, uh, if you want to install a new package, you just say, please install something and you get it. You don't need to, to compile it yourself. Uh, you use uh, usually a repository of these packages uh, in the internet. Uh, so you don't need to install anything manual. You just issue one command, that's it. Uh, so uh, now uh, looking back at history, so what we may see here, uh, project started more than 10 years ago and it started in Germany when the first uh, a wireless router uh, made by Linksys uh, was implemented such that it was that it used uh, Linux kernel inside as a base of its firmware. And since uh, Linux is GPL based, community started to push Linksys uh, to provide sources so they may reproduce the same image. And so finally, after some uh, discussion, uh, sources were disclosed, and so people started to hack on that, making it better, adding new packages. And how they did that, they just took uh, existing back in the day build, build system and started to add uh, support of more hardware, more different packages. And they continue to leave that uh, for a couple of years. And uh, something that started as a hobby of a couple of German guys uh, finally uh, became to the state when big companies, uh, most probably it was Atheris as a pro producer of manufacturer of SOCs and Netgear as a uh, manufacturer of uh, consumer devices, they started to use OpenWRT as a base of their firmware, and so they continue to do so. And uh, with years, more and more companies uh, joined them. So uh, today, uh, I think about 50% of consumer and consumer uh, wireless uh, devices, uh, I mean wireless routers, uh, they actually use OpenWRT in some form, probably some older versions as a base of their distribution. And what is also important, uh, B vendors use OpenWRT for uh, building their SDK, which they provide. So for example, SOC vendors provide uh, to uh, companies uh, uh, who produce uh, actual consumer devices. So we see a lot of companies join them and uh, probably everybody will use that finally. Uh, so then, uh, since that pro project was driven by real democratic uh, uh, things, so every developer was equal, uh, at some point they were not able to uh, agree on anything, and so uh, we saw a fork uh, that may, and, but hopefully uh, two projects will be merged back. Uh, still now, those who follow that topic know that uh, how painful it is because you don't need where to send patches to one project or to another or both, but so uh, code base is still a little bit different. Uh, so uh, that was, uh, I hope, uh, not that long introduction, and so probably this is one of the most interesting parts of my presentation. Uh, here we will uh, talk about uh, boot process of a real hardware device. Uh, 
on that slide you may see uh, different stages. So this is not some as simple as you press a button, uh, you power on your device, and uh, then you see uh, a prompting console or nice fancy window uh, asking for your login and password. No. It happens in a different stages. And so uh, we'll go through all of them and uh, we'll figure out why we need uh, that complicated uh, setup, but not something straightforward in which uh, could be com completed in two stages. Uh, so first, essentially, we power on, and what happens, then CPU jumps uh, to some location in memory, uh, which is configured as a reset vector, and either starts to execute code there, or jumps to the place where uh, first uh, part of the code exists. Uh, then that thing uh, passes control to bootrom, then so-called SPL, or secondary program loader, then we go to full-scale bootloader, then final Linux kernel, which finally starts user space. And so, uh, Let's uh, try to find out why we need that uh, complicated system. The thing is, when CPU starts, pretty much everything is uh, dead around. The only thing that works is uh, CPU core. Okay, what's that? That is nice. Okay. So first, uh, when we are here, uh, the only thing that works is CPU core. We don't have access to anything. Uh, in the best situation, we have some on uh, chip memory, which we may use. But still, first code which gets executed, this is a part of the ASIC, part of the chip. And actually, that's a ROM, which you cannot modify. And because of that, we have to build it into the uh, FPJ when we produce it. So we tape out with that code, which means uh, we have to be completely sure, not pretty sure, uh, but completely sure that uh, it is flawless. Because otherwise, if there is a significant problem there in that very little piece of code, we go to another tape out, which costs us a lot of money, and we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, that's why, uh, and it's also to keep uh, the silicon area smaller, we keep it small and simple. And because it is small and simple, it cannot do, cannot do a lot of things. It may do something very simple. So what it uh, what uh, this thing typi typically does, it reads something more uh, capable, larger from a some usually uh, storage uh, which you may modify finally. So this is not that important to have it completely bug free because in the worst case you may update uh, that newer that with newer firmware. <coughs> Again, uh, since we are very limited on resources, we may access something simple. So typically, we are talking here about uh, the first uh, page of the NAND flash, or preferably NOR flash, or it might be like uh, the very beginning, the very first block of SD card. That may we that we may afford in our firmware. And so uh, finally, and we don't do any initialization usually here, and so. Uh, to load something from external uh, storage uh, to some memory which we may use for execution, we need uh, either to have uh, on-chip memory, but not every CPU or ASIC may have it. So what happens, for example, on uh, x86 uh, CPUs, what they do, they just lock uh, cache lines and use it as a on-chip memory. And so then we execute code right, right from flash, even though it's right from cache, even though uh, we didn't load it from RAM which that cache backs up, but uh, we load from some separate uh, external storage to cache, then execute it, then we finally enable cache when we, are, when we have DDR ready. And so we may finally use DDR for something fancier. And so uh, at this point, uh, we, are, we get a secondary program loader loaded, and so we may start uh, its execution. That thing is more capable and can do more things. It may have uh, for example, more complicated driver which supports basic file system like FAT file system or full scale uh, driver for uh, NAND controller. And that means we may access, we may load more data and uh, by that time we may also initialize caches, DDRs, clocks, so we may uh, put downloaded data in DDR from which we will execute it later on. And so that is a significant difference uh, to the first thing, first uh, ROM. Uh, bootrom and uh, you see we may uh, get data from flash SD probably USB but not very likely because uh, USB stack might be very more complicated probably network again probably not uh, and on some systems actually uh, SPL will be used to load Linux current because basically that's enough uh, 
why we usually don't do that because still we have some limitations because we have to use smaller image which we cannot load with bootrom i mean bigger we cannot load but spl may load full scale bootloader uh, typically on x86 it will be grab on most of the other systems it will be uboot this is very powerful thing this is a sort of operational system or something like that because it has tons of different drivers built in it has scripting language it uh, may support uh, different fancy things may sup may uh, already uh, set up and prepare uh, more memories, uh, may even initialize a video controller and pass uh, just pointers to that uh, frame buffer to the Linux kernel. And so all these possibilities allows us, for example, to implement uh, fail-safe uh, scenarios. So first, for example, we try to download image from SD card. If we cannot do that or checksum doesn't match what we expect, we go to network. If we cannot go get it from network, we go to flash and so on. Before that, we were not able to do that because we didn't have drivers, we didn't have uh, access to enough memory to do that. And so that thing, what it does, it prepares everything to a startup Linux kernel, and if not SPL, then this full-scale bootloader loads Linux kernel. And finally, Linux kernel starts, and so uh, this is significantly bigger substance. We are talking about megabytes here compared to kilobytes before. Uh, that thing uh, could be modified essentially because we want to use newer kernels with newer firmwares. Uh, Full-scale bootloader may download from anywhere and uh, what Linux does, it uh, starts and continues its bootstrap process. Uh, again, it does a lot of initialization, uh, first of the core, then of uh, platform devices, then different drivers, and finally we are ready to f uh, run the first user space process, which is basically in it. And when we are ready, we start in it, and we are finally in user space. And uh, what happens here compared to, uh, let's call it normal desktop distributions here, because we have to run on uh, such a wide variety of different uh, boards, we first, uh, first thing we do, we need to figure out uh, what is our hardware below us. Because depending on that, so we will need to do different things. Again, we are targeting some particular devices, and we don't do all uh, generic initialization and probe 10,000 different drivers. We just uh, want to do a uh, very straightforward initialization of devices that we do want to initialize, nothing more. So how we do that? Uh, normal procedure is uh, to have a device tree blob uh, which specifies our current platform, our current board. So what we do, we just parse it and uh, from model property we read some string, compare it to uh, uh, something that we expect to get and depending on that we proceed with initialization of this and that. If that is not possible on some sy systems, we may use output of CPU info because it may contain uh, some hints for us uh, to decide what is our hardware. If it's not the case or this is not enough, for example, on the devices which may uh, survive through, say, more than 10 different iterations, each differs with a very minor modification like different uh, memory IC or different uh, network switch or something like that. Uh, what we do and so uh, that is possible because probably the same way, not probably, but so definitely that's way uh, manufacturer acts. They write some magic value or, or string in some location into the flash and we read it, compare it again with some known values, and uh, that way we decide which version of hardware we run on and what we need to do. Uh, once we know where we are, uh, we uh, continue initialization. If uh, that's the first boot we do, uh, we run uh, one uh, set of uh, scripts, otherwise we run something else. Uh, first time we do something different because we want uh, to prepare board for the user which will be usable. For example, we want some uh, network interfaces be up and running. Otherwise, a uh, user will need uh, to access these boards via, for example, serial ports, which is usually not exposed at all. So that's why we need at least to have uh, network interfaces, wired interfaces working. And uh, even though I uh, point uh, here that uh, we enable, uh, we not enable, but uh, detect uh, wireless radio, we keep it uh, turned off for quite some time before user explicitly turn it on. This is sort of a security concern because otherwise uh, wireless network will, will be open and everybody will enter that device and will do whatever he wants, which is not the thing that we want. First we want uh, to be that uh, wireless network set up properly with passwords and then we allow uh, others to log in. Then we automatically load uh, different modules that uh, we need to work with peripherals, uh, basically different drivers which were not built in into the Linux kernel image. 
And then finally, uh, all these things that I was talking about, like DHCP server, HTTP server, SSH, whatever you want, so print servers, whatever. And so uh, also in that distribution compared to some closed source so solution, you have user prompt. You may use it through serial, serial ports, SSH, telnet, and you may do you whatever you want. Uh, when we went uh, through that uh, boot procedure, uh, we mentioned a couple of companies that we, that we need to build. So boot ROM essentially we are not building because it is already in a ROM, we can't modify it, we don't care about that, we have what we have. Uh, then we need a uh, secondary program loader, full-scale bootloader, Linux kernel, uh, file system, additional packages if we want them, and uh, finally images which we deploy on the target. Uh, I don't mention here uh, separately different uh, bootloaders because, uh, for example, in case of U-boots, uh, sometimes or even usually uh, we have them combined because uh, basically uh, this is a combined image. First part, this is uh, SPL and then uh, normal full-scale boot full scale bootloader. And this is very convenient because SPL knows where to find more powerful bootloader. It, uh, it is just with a offset of something. Uh, so, uh, but what is important? Uh, we are going to build stuff for another plot platform. And so uh, we will be building most probably on x86 where uh, definitely it will be x86 uh, CPU, but it might be something with uh, Linux on top of that, Mac OS, or even Windows. And that basically means, and we will build for MIPS, ARM, ARC, uh, SH, I don't know, you name it. Uh, which means we will do cross compilation because otherwise, how we are going to build that? Which in its turn means we need to build cross tool chain, which in its turn requires uh, some helpers. And why we need helpers? We may uh, actually rely on the stuff which is installed on the user machine, but uh, then a lot of assumptions uh, like, okay, we need uh, ton tons of different packages and so preferably of a speci uh, specific versions. Otherwise, uh, we may get problems during uh, that uh, long build process. So that's why we prefer to use uh, something bare minimal like make and GCC and everything else we build ourselves. So we build for the host without cross compilation, then we continue with that uh, build tools, cross, uh, building of cross compilation tools, and then we finally ready to build images. And so uh, probably then we will build SDK as well, but basically this is a tool chain uh, protest spe specially, so it is reallocatable then, and uh, it will allow our users to build additional modules or our user space software without uh, requirement to build that huge thing. And so now speaking about uh, OpenWRT build system, as mentioned in the very beginning, uh, guys decided to use BuildRoot and BuildRoot's very nice and clean project, at least as of today. And uh, I enjoy uh, using that tool a lot. But what happened with OpenWRT? Uh, first, they started to use build, use build root more than 10 years ago. And uh, as I understood, even build root back in the day was not that nice as it as it today. And uh, another thing, uh, very limited amount of developers uh, started to work on, work on this OpenWRT, which meant uh, they did a lot of work and they uh, didn't actually think back in the day about uh, problems that uh, they may face later on. Uh, and so, so they uh, basically implemented a lot of ad hoc solutions, uh, which later on uh, became uh, constructions of uh, that thing. Uh, even though this is a makefile-based uh, build system in makefiles, uh, developer, but not user, essentially will face uh, these things or these things or even these kind of things. Even if you have quite a lot of experience with make files, you will have a very hard time trying to figure out what's happening there. And what is also important, if that piece of uh, code, if we may call that way, will be executed at all, because it depends on uh, actually if that uh, target uh, was ever called and uh, then if that dependence was there. So it's hard to, uh, to analyze what happens. And another interesting uh, 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 thing of that uh, build system is uh, usually in k, uh, k config build, uh, k config uh, configured build systems like Linux kernel, UC libc, and uh, so like busybox probably, but I'm not sure about busybox. Uh, 
we have uh, so-called DEF config. So these are minimalistic configurations uh, which are targeted to specific board, specific configurations. And this is useful because uh, you don't need so, to do configuration for each and every case uh, yourself with your hands. But here we don't do that. Uh, as I was told by one of the developers, uh, the reason for not having explicit DEF configs because they use implicit DEF configs. Uh, what that means, uh, when you select uh, some platform, uh, I this platform already defines uh, some features that it requires. And then uh, in, together with uh, default options for all the different modules and parts of this distribution, you are getting something by default. You are free to modify it uh, to your preference later, but that's what you have uh, default configuration. And again, the reason for that was uh, we don't want to maintain more than 1,000 dev configs because then it's a nightmare if you want to change at least one option. Uh, and for limited amount of people, uh, that's a huge amount of work that uh, these guys don't want to do and probably that's fine. So it, it basically, I think, has nothing to do with that hell, but it, this is another consequence of uh, a lot of work being done uh, by a limited amount of developers. And so then what happens uh, when uh, you are ready to build something, so or first you run make menu config as you do it with Linux kernel. Uh, then you select your configuration, and for users this is super nice and convenient. You have, uh, you use your arrow keys, select what you want with space, then save it, and then uh, say make downloads, you download sources uh, for different packages, and then you fire make, and so everything automatically gets built if you don't have any errors or missing dependencies, which sometimes ha happens anyways. You may build it, and so uh, again what I mentioned, uh, what is interesting today, you may actually uh, run this thing not only on Linux host, it works perfectly well on Mac OS, and some developers of OpenWRT use Mac OS as their main system without even virtual machine. And what is even more interesting, with Windows 10, you may use so-called uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, or vice versa, I don't remember what's the proper name, and build that thing there as well without virtual machine, which is, I'd say, pretty nice. So you don't need uh, to install virtual machine first. So it makes it even more affordable and easier to uh, people who want to start playing with that. So once you go through all that, uh, build steps like sources get ext extracted, patched, configured, built, and then we install it. What important to mention here as well as um, all build systems, we install not only things to the uh, target folder which will be used uh, to create a target file system, but we also install something uh, host tool essentially go to a separate location and also we have a staging location where we put for example libraries, uh, shared libraries which we will use later on for uh, linking different applications and the same libraries later will will be used on your device in root file system and so uh, that's how it works. Uh, and so then finally uh, you're ready to create a package which you will deploy on your target. Uh, depend on your on your device, for example, typical router will be used uh, NAND flash where you just put uh, built image, uh, binary image on with uh, some offset in that uh, flash. Some devices, especially development boards like Raspberry Pi or Aura boards, we use SD card as a storage because this is much simpler. You don't need so to flash something in runtime, you just uh, stick SD card in your laptop, uh, copy binary image with DD commands in Linux or special utility and Windows, and you are golden. You stick it into the uh, uh, your development board's uh, power on and it runs. That is as simple. Uh, in some cases, it might be more complicated, but usually it is not. Uh, and so, what is also, by the way, nice if we are talking about uh, real consumer uh, wireless routers. That build system prepares files which you may uh, use as a uh, uh, vendor's normal update file. So you don't need uh, to hack anything. You just uh, provide that uh, binary as uh, following instruction provided by vendor, press update button, and in like one minute you have that OpenWRT stuff deployed on your hardware. So it acts like a magic. Uh, and uh, here talking about uh, development, uh, Talking about build procedure, uh, there is one special place, which is Linux kernel. I think uh, this is also interesting part of that presentation because, again, we are building for more than 1,000 devices, and that's, that is not simple. Usually when we are talking about building kernel, what we do, we say make uh, something dev config and then we build. But here again, uh, we don't want to do it because of at least two different reasons. 
The first reason is uh, not every board is uh, supported in upstream. That's not good, but that's what we have, and we have to deal with that. The second reason, actually, to build Linux kernel for 1,000 boards, that is a very time-consuming exercise. Even if you have very powerful machine, it will take, if we assume that every kernel gets built in one minute, I think it will be like three days to build for everything, which is nice for cut and release, but if we want to have nightly testing and actually uh, guys have infra infrastructure that built it every day, then it means we won't be able to do that or we'll need a huge farm. And for open source projects, it is not something that they may afford. So what we do actually, uh, we build only for platforms. Uh, and so that's how we are getting from 1,000 from 1,000 builds to 40. And so that's what we do actually. But so then when we have image built for platform but not for the boards, we have somehow to differentiates it uh, for different boards, how, how it run on that uh, wide uh, variety of different uh, devices. Uh, as I mentioned, so either bootloader or early on kernel uh, execution, uh, we will parse device tree blob. So what we may do, we may either provide a proper device tree blob with bootloader, for example, with U-boot, and that's again preferred way because this allows us for more flexibility and uh, visibility of how it happens. There is no magic behind that. Otherwise, if we don't have a uh, U-boot bootloader or for some or another reason we don't want to do that, we may actually build separately Linux kernel, separately a lot of device tree blobs, and then we just patch in binary in Linux kernel. And so uh, with a very simple patch uh, in Linux kernel th that is possible. And then we, so we built a uh, kernel one time and then for 20 different boards, we just patch in different small binaries. It takes like one second and uh, we are done. Uh, or in the worst case, what happens, uh, we are trying uh, using some uh, logic and uh, some uh, signs of different uh, hardware, try to determine where we are running on uh, runtime as I uh, explained it before. And we use one image for different different boards, uh, still trying to figure out where we are. Uh, and another uh, problem with Linux kernel, which I already uh, actually mentioned, we don't have everything upstream. It's uh, it is not only about dev configs, but also some functionality. Uh, which is missing for different boards or some generic stuff. For example, as it was mentioned already, that problem with uh, airtime, uh, so what's the name of that? So fair, fair usage of fair time for different clients. It is not in upstream yet, but we, we may just add patches here of the tree. And so by the time it gets upstreamed, we just remove these patches. And so, so we do, so uh, we add uh, quite some patches for everything because uh, something is not dependent on platform, for example, like these uh, patches. Or uh, we may have something for specific for platform that might be something missing from upstream. Or that might be even board-related stuff. Uh, specifically, and usually, these are configuration options, like we want to enable something, but uh, still most of the stuff uh, will be here in these configs. You see configs uh, based of different, conf uh, different versions. So this is for current version 4.4, 4.1, and uh, 3.18 and uh, folders with patches here as well. So what we do, we combine uh, all together uh, this configuration with uh, uh, probably part of configuration here, and so this configuration in one uh, dot configuration file and use it for kernel configuration. The same we do with patches. We apply first uh, patches from here, then from here, and so uh, finally from patches here if uh, we have them. That's how we uh, built Linux kernel. Now talking about all uh, those of the three patches, there is a quite clear understanding about that is not really good and nice, but still we have quite a lot of patches not upstreamed yet. But uh, if we look closely at uh, these patches, we'll uh, see that actually uh, a lot of these patches backported from upstream because uh, the point is we don't want to switch kernel every two months when uh, Linux cuts new releases. And so we prefer to use stable kernels. So as of today, this is 4.4. And for this 4.4, we want to apply a number of patches, some of them security fixes, some of them uh, functional fixes uh, introduced in later versions. And so what we also see 11 patches awaiting upstream because uh, we want sometimes patches to be here 
earlier compared to when it gets to the stable branch. And so inevitably we see uh, a lot of, not a lot actually, a couple of patches uh, for different architectures and we see these 15 patches, that's not that many. And uh, for a storage subsystem and uh, drivers and also some for networking. Uh, again, there is no real reason to keep uh, keep these patches of the tree except the fact that somebody has to upstream them. And it requires some work sometimes. Uh, it requires uh, significant rework. So we have some uh, our issues fixed and uh, we are pretty happy waiting for a day when somebody does this work. Hopefully someday it will happen. And so uh, actually I'm pretty close to, uh, to the end and so uh, that's a sort of a conclusion of uh, this uh, introductory uh, discussion. Uh, what is good about this distribution and what I like? It is vendor independent Linux distribution. There is no big company behind that. So, uh, indeed, we see a lot of vendors use that, but these are not vendors who define where we move here. This is a group of people and community who decides which way to go. And uh, if you have enough uh, contributions and people know you, you may provide more ideas, even they don't know you. They, you may uh, propose something, but not sure if uh, it will be taken with enough uh, attention. Uh, another very nice thing, and so what makes OpenWRT very affordable, we don't need a lot of resources. Uh, before the latest release, uh, we had built images even for devices which support uh, like 16 megs of flash and RAM, and so uh, I know devices which run about uh, 200 megahertz, that's not that many. Even though in the most recent release uh, support was dropped, but I know for sure that support of these devices will return back, because why not? We may just not build that many packages. Uh, what is uh, also uh, interesting, a lot of different devices support it, and what is even more interesting, some devices you may really find in nearby uh, computer shop or mall, uh, it may cost, and it actually costs uh, less than 20 bucks. So pretty much everyone may get a device which already supports it. And so as for end user, uh, it is very nice because if you want more features, you install new packages. And so what also now is you have very nice Lua-based web UI, which allows you to set up those additional functions that you install. For example, you install print server, you just uh, install uh, a GUI part for that, and you are done. You just you just select your printer model, and it works. You don't need so to hack uh, CAPS configuration files. It is uh, super convenient. And so uh, two other items. Uh, this is just a continuation of the fact that it is a Linux distribution without uh, limitations. You may uh, use normal Linux tools. And so what I'm talking about here, if you have uh, something uh, like Cisco thing, you are pretty much limited with the functionality that's allowed to you. So you may use uh, special commands to do something, but you are not allowed uh, to use complicated and uh, ugly shell script. Here you may do that. You don't want shell script, okay, you install Python and use Python script. It is possible, why not? And so uh, another thing which is also important and I think very important so uh, and already was mentioned on different presentations here, uh, guys from this uh, team, they contribute a lot in Linux kernel and they are really forefront of wireless network and dis uh, development in Linux kernel. So because of them, because of their uh, customers, we have pretty nice networking stack and so uh, we are seeing it developing more and more with time. Uh, but there are downsides as well. Uh, small, small amount of people work on that a lot, and that's why oh, they don't care much about stuff they know quite well. It is a pain for a newcomer, but that's a problem. That's a problem for a newcomer, but uh, people who implemented most of the stuff, they don't care. They may remember what they did and why. So that's here, and uh, uh, that's another thing. So people may contribute something, and. Uh, submit patches, not to even submit, but accept patches like remove this, add this, or e even without that explanation, just remove. And so uh, outsider developer will have a hard time trying to figure out why that, what was, uh, what idea was behind that. And so uh, this is not really nice. And so I know a couple of places which even core developers, they don't remember why this feature is there. 
so uh, something could be dropped because okay nobody cares nobody knows what's that and uh, you don't have enough uh, information in git to figure out if it was really needed for something or not and another big problem for both vendors and uh, end users, so uh, there is no clear release cycle. So as big distributions, they release like twice a year. Here we don't know when it happens. It may happen, may not. So you cannot uh, predict uh, when you get uh, something new and stable because uh, release means we have a couple of RCs, we have uh, some stabilization periods, and that's we don't know when it happens. And most of people, they don't like to live on the edge, like on the master branch. And so uh, I will actually uh, propose you and uh, uh, will encourage you to take a part of, to become a part of that and uh, try that at least, because this is very affordable. You just get cheap equipment. Uh, if you prefer, uh, before that, uh, check that uh, this uh, hardware is supported. You just uh, grab it, install build image, and uh, you enjoy it or you don't enjoy it, and you improve that then. Or otherwise, uh, what you may do, you may get something which is not well supported or not supported at, at all and start hacking on that. Community is very welcome and just send patches. That's all simple development on GitHub and on Lit is on a different place, so still this is very simple. And this is mostly for readers of this presentation who will read this offline, a couple of interesting links which uh, might be interesting because uh, contents could be a little bit specific, for example. Uh, I was pointed uh, to that discussion, which was a real precursor of OpenWRT creation. It, a couple of complaints for core developers about uh, these links is uh, sources of uh, new rotor. I think that's pretty much it for today, uh, for my presentation. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I hope somebody will ask. <laughs> Thank you very much for these detailed presentations, uh, and uh, now it's time for questions. Um, uh, thank you once again. Uh, my question is related to OpenWRT update system. Uh, how does it handle configuration files and uh, other stuff that could be changed by the user? Uh, I have studied it once, and if I'm not mistaken, it uses overlay FS uh, to store user f user modifications on top of those default default values. Uh, could you please explain the design considerations behind that? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, that's not the kind of details I know uh, very well because I m made a port of uh, for a another architecture and for us uh, yet we don't have all uh, those complicated updates or uh, things but uh, what I saw that they use uh, scripts uh, that do some patching and modification. Uh, as for overlay FS I think uh, it is mentioned somewhere here. So what they uh, do have, a, they have that ability to uh, roll out uh, change that you made but uh, frankly um, I, I don't have enough knowledge about that. So again, I'm more more on this uh, system stuff. Okay, uh, sorry for you. that. Uh, next question. Uh, question about uh, mostly security. Uh, how how your system handles new security patches? Yeah, that's uh, three and uh, from uh, up to bottom, and how the uh, certain devices with your system can be patched with the security updates. Uh, okay, so first part, how we apply patches. That simple uh, infrastructure is in place. You just drop another patch in the folder, and uh, next time you rebuild kernel, it pa this patch gets applied. So that's how you build it. And so then, uh, keeping in mind that this is a package-based distribution, you may update even core packages. So what happens, uh, you build your newer kernel, it gets packed into a package, and uh, you install it on Flash, then you press reboot button or reset button, or you invoke this reset uh, like in GUI, uh, then this board gets reboot, a uh, new image loaded from Flash, and you are with a new kernel with, with that security patch in place. That is very simple. Okay, thank you. The, the next question. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, first of all, I have experience with OpenVRT both personally and professionally, and as a road distribution, it's absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Uh, but it's kind of maybe a request. Your build system is so much better than uh, build roots. It's better or worse? 
Much better, much better. Uh, uh, yeah, seriously. Uh, in comparison, it's builders pain less. <laughs> Open reality, when you develop profit, it's, it's easy. Uh, but here's the thing. In a commercial uh, development, I cannot use it in a anything but a router, some, some box or whatever. Uh, could you guys please split your very, very application-specific user land from your awesome build system? Please. <laughs> well, I, again, I'm not so uh, the core developer, even though I uh, contribute from time to time. Uh, I'm oh, well. You are welcome with your patches. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you propose a way to split this, uh, and uh, you get that. Essentially, again, as it is defined in the Wikipedia article, this is mostly targeted on uh, wireless devices. But you know what? Actually, I discussed uh, that uh, problem, or not problem, but what exists in their build system with the real core developers of OpenWRT. And what they told me uh, when I pointed them to a uh, builder today, they told me, well, if uh, we were about to start something new from scratch, we, will use, we would use build roots as a base because this is very clean, structured, nice, and pretty well-documented project. Yeah, exactly. But uh, featureless. I would say, in comparison to open URT. There is another uh, target for a build route, right? Excellent, uh, thank you. The next question. Thank you for the talk. Um, um, I have one remark and question with logically links to it. Uh, Johannes Berg, uh, you know, it's maintainer of wireless subsystem. On Linux Plumbers conference, uh, announced uh, wireless backports project. I don't know, maybe it's it was already uh, set at that time, but he uh, asked people to uh, get involved in that and backport wireless drivers to older kernel. And the question and continuation question of this, you know, so. I noticed uh, many uh, presentation has relied on 4.4 uh, 4 kernels, but none of them explains why. Because there is a, a nice abbreviation, LTS. So <laughs> it yes. means long so term I, I meant to, to tell about that, right? So uh, and if you uh, uh, were, if you uh, remember uh, one of these slides, uh, it was in the very beginning. So uh, if you take a look at uh, Linux versions here, you will notice that uh, this was stable, this was stable, this was stable, and this was stable, and the next one will be stable, LTS, I mean. And the only uh, thing which was not LTS, it was uh, that one, but uh, there were reasons for that decision. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, stable and LTS uh, kind of a bit different things, because we have 4.8 stable. Okay, kernel. okay. What That's I told was, I mean. was not but correct, LTS, yeah, essentially. Yeah, but, and question, the actual question is, you have 63 patches backported from open stream on one slide. Why so? Why not to push them to LTS kernel, actually, for everyone? Well, first, you know how things, uh, let's call it newer things, but actually small patches get into uh, LTS branches or any other uh, stable branches. They go there uh, through Linux master tree. So essentially, uh, once this patch gets upstream for a newer kernel, it gets backported. And again, uh, you actually mentioned very interesting thing and important, I think. In OpenWRT, we use wireless drivers from uh, wireless backports, which means even though we are on 4.4 LTS, wireless drivers are from the, like, not Linux Next, but uh, from very, very recent kernel release. So with all the features and uh, improvements and fixes for wireless drivers, that's the another important point, I think. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, another question? Show up, Yosem. Okay, so for please put the, la the, la the last mic for these presentations in this uh, report evaluation and sh uh, pull out this, uh, the this list and provide to the girls on the reception. <laughs>